of our distinguished faculty colloquia. These are colloquia by faculty members who have been named fellows of various mathematical and scientific societies. Eric is a fellow of the ACM Association for Computer Machinery. Eric received his PhD in computer science in 1982 from RPI, taught at the University of Toronto in RPI before coming here in 1996. He has graduated 10 PhD students who work at places like Facebook, IBM, MapleSoft, Antwerp University. He's held visiting positions at Tektronix, MSRI, École Normale Supérieure de Lyon, and MIT. Served as chair of ACM Special Interest Group on Symbolic and Algebraic Manipulation from 1993 to 95. He's published over 150 research articles and has contributed to commercial symbolic computation software. Thank you very much, Steve. This is like your life flashing in front of your eyes. <laughs> so uh, let's hope nothing bad happens. Uh, the, uh, the last time I, I gave a colloquium at NC State was in the computer science department and color. The title of my colloquium was The Art of Symbolic Computation. And this is such a great title, so I kept it. The Art of Hybrid Computation. So uh, I didn't. I didn't bring it up. Let me. Let me just. Uh, uh, I, I had a picture where the uh, president president of ACM hands me the diploma for the fellowship, but I, I just don't, I forgot to bring it up. But what happens when when you become an ACM fellow? People send you congratulations and they point out things to you. And so I want to show you one thing here. Which is, uh, uh, Dean has actually uh, pointed out to me that uh, I was uh, Microsoft's top cited author in scientific computing. And this was kind of weird. Uh, but it turns out actually, uh, at that time, uh, Microsoft had uh, uh, symbolic computation as scientific computing. Now they, they actually have extended it to to Siam journals, and I'm no longer the top author. So, so this is this is where the top authors are here. So, so these are all computer scientists. This is Microsoft. So this is the computer science list. And of course, I want to show off here. And so, so 22 is not so bad. Uh, remember, I was the top cited author. So, so this is the Hirsch number. I don't know whether you know this measure, the Hirsch number. The Hirsch number is. Uh, 27 papers of mine have 27 and more citations. So it's a diagonalization. <laughs> and uh, and it's, it, it's actually the top Pierce number, as you can see, is only 48. So, so this is, but what I, the reason I bring this up, of course, is to show off, but also to click on my name here. And, uh, and then uh, you can actually, you can actually play around and find out, and I hope I can find it now, uh, my co-authors. So uh, these are my co-authors. So they have this uh, web of co-authors. As you can see, my most prolific co-author is Li Hongzhi. You can actually see how this is all done by robots. So this is what they find on the internet. You can see who cites me most often. So, Xi uh, uh, at, at, uh, at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Lyon is, is the guy who cites me over 225 times on this list. But you can also click on the uh, gene genealogy graph, and uh, this is uh, actually taken from, from the uh, where they, they, they look at the web and uh, they actually show you, Bob, as my PhD. Advice. So I'm happy to say that my PhD is going to this time. Uh, all right, so I, I don't have any time to talk about this. It's a, it's a very interesting website, actually. Uh, and uh, it, it's much better than, uh, than Google Scholar because I rank much higher on the Microsoft side. <laughs> so, being a, a computer scientist, of course. So, uh, let's go back to the talk here. I have a mouse. Uh, so, uh, 
separate computations. So, of course, <coughs> the emphasis of this talk is about the word hybrid. What's hybrid about computation? So, it, it actually starts out with this famous list of the seven tools of Philip Colella. This is an interesting list. So, this list was put in a talk given at the uh, Lawrence Livermore lab. It was a classified talk. I have actually sent Colella a request for the slides. It's classified, but uh, David Patterson at Berkeley got that one screenshot from him, and these are the methods, uh, that the algorithmic methods that Philip Colella claimed consumed most of high-performance computing cycles. And it's kind of a strange list. It has uh, Monte Carlo methods in it. Of course, the Berkeley people wouldn't, wouldn't want to sit on this list. They made their own. Not very clever, the list of the 13 dwarfs. So these are dwarfs that mine cycles in computing. And uh, uh, actually, Kathy Yellick uh, was part of this list that they, they put finite state machines there, which are the computer scientists teach, I believe, in the theory class. But uh, I complained to them that uh, symbolic computation was missing from this list. And then Katie told me, actually, you're not the first person to complain to us, also logic programming is missing from this list. And uh, so what to do? Well, you make your own list. So I made the list of the seven dwarfs. I kept seven, I got the choke, seven dwarfs of uh, symbolic uh, computation. So these, these are the, the methods which, I made this list fairly quickly actually before I talk in 2008. And then somehow this list took its life of its own. And I finally wrote an article about it uh, thinking when I've done something wrong, I must say it's a, it's a pretty good list. And uh, the fourth dwarf that I have highlighted here is a uh, hybrid symbolic uh, numeric computation. So what is hybrid symbolic numeric <coughs> computation in my abstract? I said it's an algorithm that has both a symbolic and a numeric component. So what it, what it isn't is uh, running a numerical algorithm on a symbolic problem. What it isn't is uh, doing some, uh, some uh, symbolic pre-processing and then running a numeric solver. That's not what it is. So, but, uh, yeah. so, so this is, a, this is a, an area that now is one of the areas that NSA funds. The, 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 actually, Janet Ming, before she left, she told me this was one of the areas they want to push it now because everybody does it. And uh, then there are also people who want to have created it. So there are people in Canada that claim they've created this field, and there are people in Japan that claim they've created this field. So I dug deep, and I think the first paper in this field is really uh, a paper in 1974 on computing approximate GCDs by, by Donna Dunbay. Uh, and uh, then, uh, of course, uh, I had this in my talk in Canada, Bob. Uh, this was from the report by Anne Boyle and Bob Cavaniss to NSF in 1988 uh, on the state of symbolic computation in the United States. And one prediction, which was one recommendation which was made to NSF was to increase the funding at the interface. I think hybrid is a better word at the interface uh, between symbolic and numeric computing, funding course development, funding workshops. So they actually fund the research now heavily, and uh, they fund workshops heavily. But course development, I don't know whether they fund yet. What I also should say is this was put in the report in 1988. And of course, the report was made public. It was a signed publication. And then, uh, of course, people moved in slowly. So uh, what I will show you today, the work is maybe three years old. So I can say, though, that uh, nowadays we have a good foundation for it. So uh, 
there are many names for this field. Everybody wants to create the field, so uh, approximate algebraic computation, approximate cumulative algebra, it's all the same. It's hybrid symbolic numeric computation. Some people drop hybrid so that they're not associated with me because we called it hybrid in our lab. Computer Algebra Handbook. Um, so, but anyway, it's uh, been taking off. I this is this I showed this slide in a talk on, on hybrid computation at the University of Waterloo in November. And afterwards, I had a list of of previous results, but I found it boring. So, uh, all, all I will do is I will come back briefly to the approximate TCD problem because this is sort of a problem that. Uh, there's a lot of work in. It's not that interesting anymore. Uh, but I, I, oh, I made a mistake here. I didn't realize. My next slide actually was famous hybrids. OK. So there is a hybrid. The Sphinx, the Toyota Prius. <laughs> and in Canada, uh, get this dog in Canada, it's uh, the Marquis, a hybrid of wheat. I don't know whether you know this story. Uh, uh, this hybrid actually was created before World War I, and some historians claim actually it won the war. Uh, it was made with, with Austrian wheat, this Galician wheat, that's the Austrian wheat, wheat from uh, the, what is now the Ukraine. It, uh, this improved the taste of the Calcutta wheat, uh, wheat. and uh, I always say, so the Calcutta wheat, that's the numeric computing, it grows fast, but it doesn't taste good. And the, the Austrian wheat, that's the, that's the symbolic computing. It adds some flavor to the bread. Okay. I, I gave this talk to symbolic computation people, not numerical people, remember that. So, uh, so uh, approximate GCD. So the formulation here is uh, from uh, Kamaka and Lachman. Kamaka of uh, linear programming fame. I will come back to this, actually this interior point method, uh, and the way it's usually defined is, so what's an approximate GCD? So you have two polynomials whose coefficients have been deformed, and you have lost the common root. What do you do? Well, you undo the deformation, and you undo the deformation by finding the minimum deformation that gets you back a GCD. And this is how it was defined. Uh, in, uh, in, in the paper by, actually first by, by Kolesh, Gianni, Trey, Van Watt, the Isaac, 1995. And uh, <laughs> that's the way it was defined in every other paper <laughs> until I, I, I realized only in 2006 that uh, actually the approximate GCT may be unattainable. So I just say this here because some people have, write, have been written Right, have, been written, have, have written papers on this. So, so this is not so easy to construct, this counter example, where you get two polynomials where there's just not a nearest pair that have a common GCD. You need some conditions on the coefficient. So the minimum can be unattainable. We know this from total least squares. So then, of course, the next question is, how do you test whether the minimum is unattainable? And there is a paper now that we start. 2011. It's not so easy to do. Uh, but I won't talk about approximate GCD. I will talk about, as I said in my abstract, I talk about uh, the problem of reconstruct, re reconstructing a sparse signal. Now, this, uh, uh, the model I show here, you may not recognize uh, the sparse signal. Because here uh, I, I do sparse interpolation uh, with uh, a power base. So there is a sparse polynomial I want to reconstruct from its value by probing a box. So this is like interpolation, except the polynomial is sparse. And why, why this gets you a sparse signal, I, I'm not sure I can say. It, it deals with the fact that you can substitute for the x uh, an e to, the, to a complex, to an imaginary number, and then you get the sinoid signals, and if you overlay a few, that's sparse, and this is how this is connected. So I can't say this. 
So for us, it's just uh, trying to reconstruct a sparse polynomial. And of course, the game here is you can do polynomial interpolation, but uh, if you have three terms, if you have just a couple of sine waves laid uh, of one over the other, then you, you don't want to use uh, a thousand interpolation points. That's what they were using at Phillips. So, so, so can you do this with few interpolation points? And the second problem that exists here is that you don't get the values exactly. You get them with noise. Now this noise has given me a headache too because people were saying, you're not reconstructing a sparse polynomial. This box actually encodes a complicated function and you want to fit a sparse polynomial to function approximation. The, that, that's one way of viewing it. Uh, I just say you get a noisy signal and you want to reconstruct the polynomial. So what does it mean to reconstruct actually? Because you don't know how much noise you have. So of course if you keep on interpolating, you eventually eliminate the noise. You get the polynomial that fits that, uh, that uh, uh, fits those values exactly. And that's not what we are after. We are after really a sparse function that approximately fits the values. So now I know what I have next. So uh, I, I, I said it in my abstract. Uh, uh, this is, of course, uh, uh, a great accomplishment of the compute algebra people when there is no noise. So I have to show you how we do it when there is no noise. So, and uh, for that, uh, I've prepared a little maple worksheet. I will run through it very quickly, but anyway, there is the F that is a sparse polynomial, three terms. And in order for me to explain to you the algorithm, I'm going to first uh, uh, do, do a kind of an interpolation on a linearly generated sequence, so on the Fibonacci numbers, to, to, to reconstruct the recurrence on the Fibonacci numbers. So what I have to do here, because that's how the, how the code works that uh, George Juhas has written, I have to construct the power series, I have to construct the generating function for the uh, Fibonacci numbers. And I've actually given you two, because this is also interesting, in one, it's exactly the Fibonacci numbers. In another, as you can see, the, see the z to the 5 term has an error. So what happens then? Because this is also what we will encounter. We will encounter, when we do this sparse signal reconstruction, we will not just encounter noise, we also encounter outlier errors. And finally, I want to do the sparse reconstruction. I do this by, by the benoit divari algorithm. So uh, uh, it's, it's right here, you plug in into the sparse polynomials powers of the same number. And that's what I, I've been doing here. I've, I've plugged into the sparse polynomial powers uh, of two. And as you see, the, 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 the values, of course, grow very quickly because we plug in powers. And then, uh, what can I say? The, the Burlicamp Massey algorithm, which is a famous algorithm from uh, uh, coding theory, will find us uh, the generator and it will do it very similar to interpolation. So it will fit a degree one generator, a degree two generator until the generator fits. You get no more discrepancy, you linearly generate the sequence. Now you might wonder what happens when you run this algorithm on the sequence that has an error. Well, uh, uh, so, of course, first the generator fits, then it encounters the error, and uh, the Pelican Messi algorithm has no choice. It has to account for this error exactly. So what it will do is it will propose new minimum generators until, until it has run over the error, and then back pops out the linear generator for the Fibonacci numbers. Okay, so this is I, I, this is all I will say about the recovery of this sparse polynomial when there is an outlier error. Uh, 
uh, we have written a, a paper with Matt Comer and Clement Pernet on this uh, just in January. So this is, this is not the best way of doing it, actually, to, to, to locate the, this error. But I wanted to show you that it can correct the error. Now, for, the, for this mass polynomial, we do the same. We try to find the linear generator on the powers of those values. And we get the linear generator, and then, of course, as Michael will say, this is easy to see. Uh, then uh, this generator factors, and the linear factors actually give you the values of the terms. At the point. That's the exact algorithm. The exact algorithm you do essentially probably comes messy on points. I have to go back to my topic. All right, so, so, so this is, this is a, 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 a screen from uh, Wen Xin Li's PhD thesis here at NC State in 2002. This is from her thesis. And what it states is the following. So, <laughs> when you do interpolation, you don't know the sparsity. You don't know how many how many sinus waves are in this signal. How many? You don't know. It. And at that time, this was very natural to us. We we, we implemented a, a, a method which is called early termination. What we proved is, if you choose a random point in this Penoa-Divari algorithm, then uh, with high probability, the first discrepancy that is zero, that the brillicamp massey algorithm sees, is at the sparsity. Everything else before will be non-zero. So you can do early termination, you can stop there. She put that in her thesis, she did the probabilistic analysis, and uh, went off to the University of Waterloo, and uh, converted this algorithm at the University of Waterloo, to uh, a numerical algorithm where there's noise in the values. So, early termination, so, so now it, it's a numerical algorithm, and uh, this is much later actually, I proved this in 2007. Uh, so, so you, you pick, so the, the, problem, the problem here is the following. In, in, the, in the exact case, you can do a probabilistic analysis. You say if you pick if you pick the random point from such and such size subset with this probability you will succeed. But in the numeric case, you not just deal with the probabilistic analysis, but you also deal with the noise. So 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 you, you have two phenomena to deal with. And of course, the way I tried to do it is first was to just say, well, you deal with the noise exactly the same way uh, that we deal with it uh, exactly. So, but instead of proving that a point is non-zero, we prove that it's separated from zero. So that, we, so, so that when we pick a random point, the first time we get something small, we stop. Because all the good points are going to be separated from zero. And we prove, I proved this, this is what I call the numeric simple Schwartz lemma. It's not that interesting to read to you, but uh, actually I'm kind of proud of this because the proof is based, it's, it, it's a two-line proof based on an algebraic sample theory. It's very simple to prove. And then when Sheng Feng Yang came, on, on his fellowship here, I said, implement the algorithm. And it didn't work. Can somebody guess why it didn't work? Can you repeat the question? Why did this algorithm not stop at this point? Yeah, what can you say? Uh, <laughs> you 
see, I learned it the hard way. I, it takes me, I was working, I, I, I actually wrote down the formulation of the approximate CCD problem in 1986 in one of my proposals. It's actually funny, sometimes you should just publish your proposals and you can say, hey, that's my definition. It's in an NSF proposal before anybody else. And uh, somehow, 25 years later, I realized that somehow I, I, I didn't quite understand it. So uh, the answer is, of course, yeah, sure. You can identify the elements that are not zero. But can you identify the zero? And there the answer is, of course not, because that's what the theorem says. The first time you hit sparsity, that uh, Heinkel matrix that corresponds to the, to the discrepancy will be ill-conditioned, ladies and gentlemen. That's what indicates sparsity. But uh, of course, as everybody in the room knows, when you solve an ill-conditioned problem, your answer is anywhere. Anywhere but zero. It's nowhere close to zero. So we overrun the sparsity. Because we try to look for zero. And of course, the answer is very simple. You don't look for zero. You look for ill-conditionedness. So, uh, and then there is a secondary question. What do you do with uh, the the round of error analysis in simple sum, but th that's not interesting. That's a boring paper to do the error, to do the round of error analysis. This is the interesting paper. How how input sensitive is that discrepancy? And uh, what what can I say? I mean, there are theorems. There, I, I cited Rob's theorem on on the condition number of a Huckel matrix. Structure condition number of Huckel matrix was a was a was a celebrated theorem that the Huckel matrix has a structured condition number that is equal to uh, unstructured number. And of course, uh, what can I say? Uh, one is so influenced by numerical textbooks. The, 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 you know, the zero matrix does not, is not ill-conditioned for the determinant. Uh, this, is, this is something that uh, took me a long time to realize, of course I speak of the absolute condition number. There are matrices that are ill-conditioned for the determinant, but not the zero matrix. So we, you somehow have to deal with the condition number of the determinant, and th that's what we did in our 2011 SNC paper. Uh, what is interesting is, so this gives me the early termination, but uh, uh, it doesn't yet give me the probabilistic analysis for the randomization. Uh, the probabilistic analysis for the randomization was done by Wang Jing Li in a beautiful way. So, so I don't know anywhere else where this is done. Where, where they, we tried it for topless, but couldn't do it uh, with Jack. But uh, for this particular case, this is a Huckel matrix that has special structure. She could actually do the probabilistic analysis of the condition. So, uh, what I want to say here is the following. This method actually is about uh, 200 years old. It was, it, it was invented in the French Revolution. It's called Prony's method. Actually, he does it for exponential functions, not for polynomials. He measures, uh, <laughs> if you have, if you have a, a vapor with uh, different alcohols in it, how do you determine which kind of alcohol? is in that vapor. And uh, this is called Brownie's method, and it stayed in the numerical analysis textbooks until the 50s. And then it was removed. It was removed because it was recognized as being a method that uh, fails on ill-conditioned inputs, and the uh, inputs happen to be often ill-conditioned. It was taken out. We don't run numerical methods on ill -conditioned. The question is, why, did it, why does it come back in now? So, uh, I will give this answer in a moment. Uh, but maybe some of you can see it. Well, uh, the other thing is diagnosing ill-conditionedness. That was another sort of... Uh, I don't, I'm getting old, Bob. I should, I should see this right away. 
he, he saw me when I was uh, young. So how do you, how do you, so, so of course one thing that everybody does is estimate the condition number. And then uh, they tell you, uh, Jim Demmel has a paper on the condition number of the condition number. And it's like, what is this? I mean, uh, what you, what you, you don't have to estimate the condition number to find an ill-conditioned situation. You do what they call statistic, stochastic sensitivity analysis. You run two values that are very close together, and by the time they shoot apart, you have hit the ill-conditioned point. So what changed? Why does this method come into, into this problem with the vengeance? So I'm going to give the answer. I don't want to give it away. So I mentioned the paper with Matt. Where's Matt? Oh, man, they are mentioning the paper with Matt. Uh, we, we are also interested in smoothing over outliers, not just accounting for the noise. And I will tell you why this is. And uh, everybody has to realize this, please. The exact polynomial that interpolates those points is extremely dense. Don't do exact interpolation on numeric data. It has to be approximate, otherwise you introduce density. But, uh, and that's my picture that uh, Steve, you didn't want it, right? This is the picture of the baby. So, uh, so Menchin Lee actually brought this method, the numeric method, to Antwerp. And, uh, what, uh, and she got into this medical signal processing, in, in particular reconstructing the signals of the EEGs, the brain, brain waves, because uh, these signals have spikes when there is a seizure in, in the baby. And, uh, and what the software tries to do is discover these spikes. And uh, actually, th as the story goes, the Phillips people ask her, how many points did you need? And she said, well, <laughs> this, is, this is brownie, we only need twice as many points as the sparsity, and I think she had a sparse signal of five waves, so maybe 10 points, she, did, she said, but I only needed 12 points. And they had done it with a thousand. So, so and then you get, then you get, then, you, then people pay attention. But the question is, what has changed? Why can we do it now? By the way, also, because we heard this in some interview talks, the, the compressive sensing, Technology L1 norm, L1 norm is inferior to this method. We have compared our method to the L1 norm method. What has changed? Why is the Brownian method come back in, coming back in? And the answer to this is early termination, ladies and gentlemen. Because of randomization and because of engine's probabilistic analysis, you have well-conditioned sub-matrices until you hit the sparsity. So, I say it in simple words. We never compute the ill-conditioned result. We use ill-conditionedness as a termination criterion. By the time we hit the ill-conditioned matrix, we are done, finished. And what, of course, the numerical analysts didn't have, but what Brownie didn't have was randomization. Probabilistic analysis, analysis saved the day. Is that a question there? Yes. You said that five, five component plus a... Pardon me? Five component plus five waves, let's say. Yeah, but I don't know how many she had. They gave her some data. Yes, it's, all, it's all proprietary. <coughs> so you can't even then, give me the data. Ten, 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 ten radiations, right? Well, uh, you... you, you, you uh, you do more than just the algorithm I've shown you. This is, uh, it's a, it, the, the, there's technology that enters afterwards. So you can do, the, you, you can do mature, it's, it's not so easy. It's not okay. that simple. If this is just sort of the underlying idea. idea. Uh, <coughs> you can go to smartcare.pe and look at what they are doing. Uh, this technology is used for medical, monitoring devices, like you will have an iPod that measures your, your brain waves and then transmits a signal. It's used for signal compression. That's what it's used. I call it a killer application that saves babies. 
So, uh, well, where's the symbolic component? There's a numerical algorithm, Brownian's algorithm, and the variable. Where's the symbolic component? Yeah, the randomization. The randomization comes from symbolic computation. And this early domination theorem, the exact theorem, is not so easy to prove. You try to prove it. This took us a while to prove that theorem. So, and. Uh, uh, but uh, but the early termination saves the day because it keeps the submatrix is well conditioned and uh, <laughs> it's a lot of money right now to, to design this uh, this software. Uh, I'm I'm now changing to a second problem and maybe that's dangerous. So uh, and I have not much time for the second problem. Uh, so this is actually two talks. And the first <laughs> talk is over now. So, so if, you, if you have lost me, now wake up. Now you have a chance to get back on board. So, and the second talk is a second killer application we found, which has nothing to do with, with medical signals. But I, I'll show you what we do. Uh, so, uh, I, I need to introduce a notion here. So, so uh, I said it in my abstract, if you read it, uh, the objective here is to prove that uh, a, a, a minimum that has been computed numerically is the global minimum. It's usually computed by, by, by local method, loop iteration, and then you have this value, and then you, is this really the global minimum? So what, what to do? And I did two, two notions. I need the notion of a polynomial <coughs> being positive semi-definite. That's a polynomial it never takes a negative value. x squared, x minus y squared. And the second notion I need is for a matrix, for a symmetric matrix to be positive semi-definite. And this means that all eigenvalues are non-negative. It's actually quite interesting that these two notions are related. And uh, the relation comes from uh, Emil Artin's uh, solution to Hilbert 17 problem. So uh, a polynomial, yeah, I, I have to go back because why is this important? I wrote this down here. The global minimum, when you subtract the global minimum or the global infimum from the polynomial, you get a positive semi-definite polynomial. Because it's always greater or equal that minimum. So, so that's what you want to certify, that f minus mu never takes a negative value. The way we do this is uh, by constructing uh, a hilbert artin representation for the polynomial. So this is a celebrated theorem. It was conjectured by Hilbert, proven by Emil Artin, uh, that uh, a polynomial is probably semi-definite if it's a fraction of two sums of squares of polynomials. So one direction is obvious, right? If it's a, sum, it's a fraction of sums of squares, then it cannot be negative. And you can take the squares and you can write the squares as a, a term vector transposed times a positive semi-definite matrix times a term vector. And the reason for this is because of the Cholesky factorization of the positive semi-definite matrix. And I, I, I won't say much more about this. this. I don't know whose idea this was, I, 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 but uh, uh, so, uh, so, what we, uh, so all we have to do, at the quotation mark, all we have to do is find these two matrices. That's all we have to do. Yeah, so there is a, I'm, I'm hiding something here. You somehow have to know the degree of these squares. And uh, 
we actually say when uh, there is no denominator that the polynomial is a sum system. Now, uh, this is just for you. I mean, everybody shows this example. Uh, some polynomials, some positive semi-definite polynomials do require a denominator. So not every positive semi-definite polynomial is, uh, is a sum of squares. And the famous example here is Moskin's polynomial took 70 years to find. An explicit polynomial that is not a sum of squares. People always say a, a quadratic denominator suffices and never show you what the answer. How do you do it with a quadratic denominator? So, I took this from a paper, and then I computed my own. As you can see, our software is not so bad. It gets a nice, nice little representation. I asked Bruce Resnick whether he knew this representation for the masking polynomial, and he's not sure this is in the literature. And it's, it's actually very simple. But this was computed. This we didn't find that. Okay, so so what happened? I mean, Emil Artin proves his, proves, uh, solves Hilbert Seventeen's problem, publishes his paper, uh, I say this for the grad student, as a technical report. It's in, it's in the in a technical report that the mathematics department of Hamburg in 1927. And then he writes in his paper, it's, it's in German, I can read German, he writes, and I believe that my proof will find will be convertible to an algorithm that computes the representation. And he was a smart guy in Latin, but on that one he was wrong. Totally wrong. So what happened? Semi-definite broken. And uh, uh, what can I say? Uh, it's, it's a buzzword, semi-definite programming. Uh, what is it? So uh, I've written down here a block semi-definite program. So semi-definite programming is a slight gener generalization of linear programming. So this, uh, the, if you look at the program here, this is a program in, in primal form. If you look at the program, this looks like a, a linear program. These, uh, these big dots we use, these are, these are Kartik Shiva Ramakrishnan's uh, uh, inner products. He wrote the big dots so that it looks like a scalar product. So this looks very, very similar to a linear program. There's only one slight restriction. You have to solve this linear program for matrices that are positive semi-definite. And that's a non-linear constriction. Why can you do this? Well, the answer is because it just so happens that the interior point methods first invented by Karchian, actually it's not true, it's Nemorovsky, he invented it for convex programming. The cone of positive semi-definite matrices is a convex set. So you do convex optimization here, and the interior point methods just work. And they are implemented, say to me, uh, you can see the, these are all implementations in MATLAB. There's an implementation coming in Maple 16. They told me uh, that they are going to implement the high precision STP solver because I showed them the application. And I will show you the application also. So we can, we can find positive semi-definite matrices. I just go back so that, so that, ah, I don't go back. I go forward. You see, these, these are, these are positive semi. This is a, a, a multiply field. This is a, a, to solve something in positive semi matrices. It's that easy. Well, it's not that easy. Oh. So what? What do we have to do? We, we, so, so here is the solution. This is the solution point. This is the positive semi-definite matrix that gives you the sums of squares. All you have to. So see, it's in the cone of positive semi-definite matrices. It, it satisfies the equation, but you have to find it. Well, the semi-definite solver is supposed to find it for you. But it gives you a numerical answer, ladies and gentlemen. So you don't know. Are you 
outside the cone or inside, then you convert it to exact, you lose the sums of squares. So you have to take the numerical solution and you have to somehow project it to an exact. That's where the symbolic action is. This one is the numeric action. It's a typical hybrid algorithm. It has two components. Yeah, I, I should say to you, uh, uh, this is work with my Chinese collaborator, Li Hong Shi. Uh, she came here in 2007, where we started this. We saw Pablo Barillo's paper on when the, when the solution was a strictly feasible point. And uh, we, we actually uh, investigated the case where the solution is, uh, is uh, on the boundary of the cone, which is often <coughs> the case. And moreover, uh, we also <coughs> what did I want to say? Okay. Well, let's look at the yeah. Uh, let's look at the example. Yeah, we changed the, the, the you see, uh, the, the CME solver had to be, had to be, you don't get a, high, a, a, a good enough solution, so, so what you have to do is, you have to uh, do this iteration to get a high precision solution. Okay, so, I will get to the end of this talk. So this is a, an example, Wodonoi 2 is a test example which was constructed from uh, nonlinear Voronoi diagrams, it's a polynomial with, I don't know, 256 terms. And th this polynomial actually is positive semi-definite, but has a zero, has a real zero on a higher dimensional subvariant. As Daniel Lassad said, it gets to zero, but it never crosses it. So every zero is a multiple zero has a higher multiplicity because it, it goes back up. All right, so this polynomial, ladies and gentlemen, it's on record. I will say it was sent to Berkeley by Daniel Lassad. He asked, is it the sums of squares? And the answer came back, no. I mean, they ran the city missile on it, and uh, then somehow Leon discovered this polynomial. Yeah, I, 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 I forgot to say this. Uh, actually, uh, we should not be able to compute the sums of squares for this polynomial. Because it has zeros. And uh, therefore, the, the proof is ill-posed. If you change the zero, if you subtract epsilon from that zero, uh, the uh, add epsilon to that zero, uh, your inequality gets violated because it reaches zero. So this is an ill-posed problem, and I gave an example here that is much worse because if you if you slightly perturb a coefficient, you change the min you can change the minimum from zero to minus infinity. My favorite my favorite ill-posed problem x minus y squared. You change one coefficient by epsilon. The infimum goes to minus infimum. We have no business of solving this. An ill-posed problem, and we run it numerically, ladies and gentlemen. We run the numeric CDME solver on it. Why would we get it? And uh, it's always helpful to work uh, with a young person. We realized that afterwards, by the way. If you're ignorant, you, you do it, and you get the sums of squares. This algorithm I've, I've shown you in the picture computes for Euler 2 six polynomials where when you square them together, you add them, you get one. <laughs> Bob, Daniel Lazar asked me three times, are you sure you have Euler 2? The third time, I just sent him the polynomials. So square those polynomials, add them up, and check whether it's Euler 2. It's a proof. <laughs> okay, so this is an email I got uh, on 
on February 12th. Uh, what do I get? So, so we, we didn't just do Warner too, by the way. We did the uh, polynomials from the monodon column permanent conjecture. We did the rump model problem. We did a bunch of open problems. We proved that these polynomials were, uh, were positive. semi definite we proved lower bounds on, on global lower bounds on, on what was considered challenge problems in polynomial optimization. And then we opened up our mouth speak and said, we can do all of them. And of course, we can't, uh, but because the polynomial in general is incomplete. So, so this guy does finite element methods. Look what he sends me. He sends me polynomials. <coughs> can you, Professor Caldor, can you, can you prove that this polynomial is positive? <laughs> okay, so I should say that uh, 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 ours is not the only uh, is not the only method. Uh, actually, there is also Mohab Safed Din gave a talk here, and he has a he has a, a method based on critical values. They're competing methods, and uh, some polynomials. He can do, he can do some polynomials. Both of us can do some of the polynomials he can do, and some of the polynomials we can't do because the problem in general is empty complete. So this shouldn't work. So the question is why why does this work? And I don't have a good answer. Did it work on that one? Pardon me? Did you do the <laughs> <laughs> I got it on February 12th. I had to prepare a colloquium. <laughs> no, we, we, I, I, it's a large polynomial. So it, it, it takes some time. He could have typed it into Rack Lab, but it's in, it's in Maple. Uh, he told me, he, uh, actually, I should have read, I should have read his email to you, sending me errors out after two days. MATLAB crashes after two days with an error message. It's numerically unstable. Has become numerical instead. I, I sort of didn't want to read this to you because there are too many numerical analysts sitting in the room here. So, about the. Uh, yeah, so I'm at five more minutes. Um, There's so much to say. So what do you want? Do you want a certificate that, that the polynomial is positive semi? That the, uh, Stefan Salter is not interested in how long it takes us to compute. He wants to check it. And the sum of squares is a certificate. So I introduced this notion of a certificate, with, uh, and I have this from my card. There are famous certificates to, to prove that uh, a graph is non-planar. You embed uh, K33 or K5 in it, and that's a certificate that it's not planar. That's an example from my math 351 exam, by the way. They have to do this on the exam. So uh, then I, I define what's a certificate. I cannot say what's a certificate right now. This is actually our definition, it's a new definition. But what do we want? We want a certificate that the matrix is positive semi Or this is the alternative. Or that the Hilbert Artin representation we try to construct is too low of a degree. You see, maybe you didn't see it. Why can it be NP complete and we can solve it? Well, we still have to choose the degree. And if this degree is too large, our semi definite programming programs just become huge. So, and uh, so this, for this, I, I wrote the paper, this in 2011. We actually didn't solve the problem. I don't have good certificates for showing that matrix is a positive semi-definite. Don't tell me you can do it by the Cholesky factorization, because it's a slow certificate. They, they, then you don't have to give him a certificate. You just say, do the Cholesky factorization, you could see it. So, but uh, this was more interesting to me 
Because what happened to us is, you see, our, our solvers don't work. And we don't know why we fail. We try to find a rational solution for our sums of squares. Maybe the sums of squares doesn't have a rational solution. Or our denominator degree is too small. We don't know why we fail. And this would answer that question. We fail because the degree is too small. So how do you prove that Motzkin's polynomial is not a sum of squares? So Motzkin, of course, did a proof, beautiful argument, which doesn't generalize to anything, based, based on the sparsity. So I, I have, a, I have a two more screenshots, and then I'm finished. Um, I, I, I leave the best for last. I, I learned Farkas' lemma taking a numerical analysis class at the University of Linz as an undergraduate in 1976. And I completely forgot it. Farkas' lemma is a certificate for invisibility. It's a certificate. It produces a certificate that a linear program has no solution. So I, 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 I show it to you here in a, in a special form. So that there is no solution to AX equal B with non-negative entries in the X. This, this means this linear program is infeasible. How do you prove that something does not exist? And Farkas' lemma says, well, you just solve another linear program, and if that program has a solution, then the first one does. By the way, the other direction is trivial. I didn't write it down. If you can have such a vector y, then obviously there cannot be an x. But, uh, so, I looked up my old notes from, I brought them over, my old notes from the numerical analysis class in Linz. I looked up what we wrote in Farkas Lemma, and we wrote uh, exactly one of the two is true. Either there's a feasible solution for A, or there's a feasible solution for B. And this is how we deal with the infeasibility of uh, semi-definite programs. This lemma, of course, is, is new. There's a condition on a linear matrix inequality. Uh, this uh, particular lemma has given my collaborator, Feng Gu, a lot of headache. So this is, this is, uh, this is a non-trivial generalization of, of factors this way. But, but, but it looks exactly the same. Either the, uh, the, 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 the semi-definite program is feasible or another semi-definite. So here's the proof that Motzkin's polynomial is not a sum of squares. You just run acting proof on the, on the dual problem. It's automatic. You don't have to do anything. So I have one minute left. And uh, I, so, so this is my last slide coming up. But I want to sort of have a drum roll here because uh, so Motzkin's polynomial is a polynomial that is not a sum of squares. But the, uh, of course we want to write a paper and say we have a polynomial where a denominator of degree 2 doesn't work. How do you find such a polynomial? It took 70 years to find Motzkin's polynomial. The, so, so this is this is a generalization of Motzkin's polynomial to exclude uh, square denom uh, denominators of degree 2, denominators of degree 4. How do you find such a polynomial? With a little help of a friend, of course. Uh, for that, we had help. Uh, so uh, everybody, I think, knows if you have a question of it on the given polynomial sums of squares, and so you have to ask Bruce Resnick. He just gave us the polynomial. He couldn't prove these conditions which we proved with uh, with uh, Farkas' lemma and uh, semi-definite programming, but this polynomial set the property. 
Just like that. You get the examples, you submit the paper and you hope for the best. As I said, first polynomials which are proven to not allow the tragic and what the phenomenon doesn't. I finish on time, Steve. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments? Can you show us the last slide? People, thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Don't ask me how we, how, how they found this, 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 we constructed these polynomials for for properties of uniform denominators. To prove the properties for uniform denominators by him, and proves actually when I told him about art improver. He wanted to have some answers to this. And he sent me the polynomials. He sent me the polynomials maybe uh, three years ago. And then we tested them out. We, we, this paper is new. We, we, we just wrote it, Feng, Feng Google and uh, Li Hongxi. And it works. They, are, they don't allow quadratic denominators. There's also, we also constructed some fractions. So. These are all new theorems for a given polynomial. Of course, uh, they wanted to know the entire family. For the entire family, we can do nothing. Yes. Yeah. So, yes. But you can also happen that neither of them is. Neither the primal nor the dual, and you don't know anything. No, that's not true. Farkas is never said exactly why. No, in your case, because of no. unknown reasons. Like in practical. Like uh, what do you mean? Like you're trying to solve this, you don't get anything. No, here we, here we just, here we did, just compute, compute what is called the separating hyperplane, the y vector in Farkas's lemma. But you, you also have to solve here an SOS. No, no, it's a semi definite problem. Or a semi definite problem. And let's say that you. Yeah, so, so I understand what you mean. And, uh, so, so, uh, so in the paper, we prove that the separating hyperplane is a, is a strictly feasible solution. So then you're in the easy case. You're not on the bottom. So you'll always be able to compute it, if it's the case. From a high precision, this is a bubble parallel theorem. You compute a high precision approximation to the, to the dual semi-definite program, and you know when you round it, you will have to separate it out. Because it's a, it's, it's a strictly feasible solution to the problem. I know, that was your question. I think. Now the problem is if it, if, if it is a sum of squares. If, if the denominator of degree... Of, uh, so, so here we consider that the denominator of degree 4 should work, but then we have to compute the sum of squares. And that lies on the boundary. And those we don't have yet. So it's actually this is actually easy. Okay, I think we better stop and continue the discussion informally afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.